Hey there, and welcome to this special edition of Latitude Photography Podcast. In this episode, we're going to be taking a look at your top images of 2021. These are listener-submitted images, and I'm just so glad to have Drake Dick here to comment on these images, to review some of these images with me. Uh, Drake, hey, welcome to the show. Hey, Brent. Uh, it's great to be back on again, and I'm looking forward to seeing some great images. Uh, I went through them a bit already, and uh, really like what I see. Yeah, so we have some great images to be looking through, and our intent is, as we're looking through on the screen, we do have this both in the YouTube world and in the audio-only world, and so if you'd like to take a look at these images when we're talking about them in the audio-only world, I invite you to get on to the Latitude Photography Podcast Facebook group, and there's a little tab there, at least if you're in the desktop experience, there's a little tab there called Topics, and then you can scroll down to where it says Top Images 2021, and then you'll be able to filter out all the posts that are related to this topic that we're talking about. And I'm just going to go through these images and we're going to be taking a look at maybe two from each person, possibly three from each person, something along those lines. So you ready to go, Drake? I'm ready. All right, let's do it. We have the first set of images from Sam Cooper. And as I click through some of these images, I've seen some of these before. He is a member of over at Latitude Photography School, and it looks like I hit the wrong button to continue with these images. And this image, though, I haven't actually seen before. So this one I wanted to really concentrate on Drake. And the thing about it is the symmetrical balance is, to me, is pretty amazing. I'd like to have you to pick it up from there, though. What do you think about this image? Yeah, I, I like this. Uh, it's got that strong center line that draws you right through. And yeah. uh, the the benches on either side there, the red color of it, it, it all works really well together. The contrasting lines coming in like that. Yeah, so we have just a bunch of, it's like a stadium seating. We have the concrete steps, the little things, you know, they're numbered 12, 13 as you go on up. And then those those red benches, the red tops of the benches, very strong, beautiful color going against that still warm hued concrete but it also feels like it's wet concrete it's like it's just freshly rained and there's per, everything is just perfectly aligned a lot of attention has been given to these details of aligning all of these lines with the edges so it feels crisp it feels very purposeful and images like this when you pay attention to those details they really start to come through very strongly yeah what do you think about this next image? Also the idea of stadium seating, but is the, I mean, I guess it's just a black and white conversion. Yeah, it looks like it. But uh, again, it, it's one of those uh, abstracts that look really nice. Uh, uh, multiple patterns between uh, the rows going up and sort of the multiple arcs of like the, the stand uh, portion of the seat. Uh, the brace itself forms nice little arcs in there and it's, it's just really intriguing patterns that it uh, gives and uh, attracts the eye to. Yes, we we have strong patterns, strong repetition, and which makes those patterns lots. And then what's really fun to see is how down in the lower section, the lower left especially, the the way that those are portrayed, they're very simple shapes. But as you go up towards the top of the frame, either the right hand side or the left hand side doesn't matter. But you start to see. Uh, gradually and then you really see as you get up towards the top the supports underneath and so it just really transforms those shapes and they become more complex as you reach the top of the image so we have that gradual transition too which is an interesting thing to to look at yeah as we finish off the collection we've got a, a barn and some you know some park scenes a few details here some some leaf details and yes, definitely great to see some images like this coming through from Sam. So thank you, Sam, for submitting those images. The next listener that we're going to be taking a look at their images is Ryan Cameron. And he says, I would be remiss if I didn't include any shots taken on a roller coaster. Here, I was aiming to include the other train, which naturally, due to safety features, can only be so close to the train that I'm in. While I could crop closer, I really think showing the loop of the track lets the viewer see where the trains go. Absolutely. Yeah. Being able to get a sense of space here is pretty good. I'm thinking though, Drake, you know, when we when we see video, especially, you know, whether you're on YouTube or wherever, 
of this type of, of this type of item where you're on a roller coaster. So often you're on the front of the, right. the roller coaster. And here he is at least in the middle, possibly in the back of the roller coaster. I'm just wondering how that changes the view for you. Yeah, it, it gives you a different experience. Certainly, um, uh, you you see more of what's going on in the scene, right? You can tell um, that you're in the roller coaster. Uh, it, it adds something that you normally don't see, which is interesting. Um, yeah. And I, I do like the way he's left the horizon line on a slope. We, I mean, usually I like the nice straight horizon lines, but here with the roller coaster and that, it gives you more of that sense of uh, motion. So, Absolutely, because I would presume the the roller coaster is at an angle itself, so it's more true to your position on the roller coaster. So it gives that sense of reality there for sure. Right. Then certainly the bright sunshine, the bright colors, all of that adds in. We have a little bit of motion that is evident in some areas, you know, here, especially on the left-hand side of the frame where it feels like there's a little bit of motion blur, but it's one of those shutter speeds that's just right to, in some locations, you feel a sense of motion, but other areas, it's just as sharp as it needs to be in order for it to feel like a successful photograph that tells you what you want to know and gets the idea across for what the photographer is trying to convey. So, yeah, I, I think that's definitely got some some good points coming through. On yeah, this for one. the challenges you would have had uh, taking it on a moving roller coaster, that was uh, really well done. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so this next image, this is, uh, it says, a drone shot in Las Vegas of the high roller. I had secured the necessary permissions with the FAA and drone geofencing to fly near the high roller wheel. Now, I'm, that in of itself is kind of impressive, I guess, because I'm sure there's at least a little bit of, of just things you got to do, buttons you got to click on some website. I don't even know what that process is, but otherwise your drone just won't fly. So you got to get that permission and then you can get the drone going and get it to, to fly there. And so he says he's lining up the sun with the center of the wheel helped make this an otherwise plain sunset a bit more interesting. And I certainly can agree with that idea where it, it does help make, you know, we do have a little bit of interest on the, on the background there with a little bit of clouds. And if it were later in the day, you know, another 15 minutes or so, we're probably going to have some, some fairly dramatic color, but with this with this form that is effectively silhouetted against that plain sky that really does make uh, a more interesting i guess foreground element which just brings in the whole story of this element in its location next to what the link and harris and it looks like the flamingo so we've got it with all these different hotels and it just, and I mean, this is the type of image I would expect to see on Las Vegas's website or, you know, some pamphlet or brochure or as a splash screen to some video or something like that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've, I've been to Vegas and taken a picture of this before, but uh, until I read that he took a drone, I was trying to figure out uh, how he possibly got that particular angle. But yeah, it, it's really well done. Like you say, it uh, looks like it would be on some sort of advertisement for them. And kudos for going through that extra step of getting the FAA approval. That's definitely yeah. a good a good deal there. All right, a few more items that we'll just take a quick look at from Ryan as we're just kind of tapping through. So those in the audio, you know, we're, we're just kind of basically giving a couple of seconds to each image. You know, the former Qualcomm Stadium on this one, that's rather interesting. I, oftentimes I like to explore rundown areas or places like this where it's crumbling is literally crumbling and there was between here and my folks in, in nowheresville oregon there's an old cement factory that they finally have completely removed now but for years and years and years it was in various states of disrepair and i so wanted to get out and shoot because it was right on the highway extremely easy access but I just never did it because I'm always just, I always got that goal, going to visit mom and dad, or I'm returning home. I got to get home. And yeah, so now that's an opportunity lost. But to see these types of things, I don't know what, how you feel about these things, Drake, but yeah, I, tend always, to, I tend to like them. Yeah, they're always interesting to explore. And uh, um, because you're so used to seeing things 
in good condition. When you see them deteriorating yeah. like this, it really adds a, a, a different feeling to it. And uh, I like to when I can as well. Yeah. Yeah. There was a place, it just for some reason, just reminded me, um, just outside of Veracruz, Mexico. Uh, I forget the the the, na- the dude's name, but he had his his compound. He was an explorer, you know, hundreds of years ago, and he had his compound. And a friend and I took a taxi out there and explored that. And the roots from the trees are just overtaking all of this you know, all these, uh, con- concrete style walls and things like that. So probably not hundreds of years ago, but anyway, and it's just that idea, you know, the, the, the transformation of nature from man-made objects succumbing to the nature. It's kind of an interesting thing to, to witness and an interesting thing to explore and record. Certainly in something like this that we're looking at here from Ryan, I don't know that I would want to climb the ladders or the stairs or whatever and get on those things. I would fear for my life possibly, but there still might be some things that you can do on the periphery and, and explore those types of things. Yeah, for sure. So we'll finish it off here. Oh, here's one from a cruise ship. That looks like a lot of fun. And I have personally never been on a cruise myself, but man, that looks, that would be awesome to. Oh yeah. To do something like that. All right. And then ending here with uh, an image from from uh, the Golden Gate Bridge. Yeah, that's a unique view. Yeah. All right. All right. This next one is from Yerik Lanoshka. And I, I pray that I'm getting that, that name pronounced properly. So forgive me if not, but I'm going to go ahead and just start on this first one, but I'll hand it on over to you first off, Drake. This is a waterfall. We've got a few colorful rocks in the waterfall. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, it's just, it, it feels like it's from up north. What do you think about this one? Yeah, I, uh, I like waterfalls. Uh, one of my favorite subjects. And uh, um, he's got a good uh, shutter speed on this. So you can see the flow. There's still some texture in it. It's not totally washed out. Um, and uh, the way the water comes down at the bottom, it, it's smoothed out, but it's still got that, uh, uh, the lines of flow in it from the water. Yeah. Um, and you, like you say, it looks, feels Northern. I don't know if it's uh, over here or if it's somewhere uh, overseas. It, it looks different than what I'm used to around here. Of course, with us here, there's all the lush uh, greens and trees and yeah. things. So this is really a different landscape and uh, I uh, like the coloring in the rocks and it it uh, adds to the whole feeling of it. Yes, the color in the rocks is where I was going to start with it because it really, you know, the from the 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 rocks in the far foreground areas on the, on the extreme left and right, they're providing an excellent framing element and they're really providing good stability for the image. They're not super duper detailed. They don't, you know, we've, we've taken away a little bit of that detail and then that's great because we want the eye to rush into where all the detail is. And like you mentioned with that, with, with the texture that's coming through in the water, you know, I always like to experiment with shutter speeds when I'm shooting water like this, so I can get it just right. And as far as the, the feel of the grass, it feels like the, the type of environment when I was in Alaska a couple of years ago on Unalaska Island and from what I've seen from like Faroe Islands and other places like that. So it seems like it's just an extreme far north location. And I just wish we had a little bit of commentary here so we could understand exactly what we're looking at and dealing with. But as it is here, you know, this is still a good, strong image. The only thing I might, if I were to have a, a bit of a query about what could it be? What would it look like if kind of an idea, a suggestion maybe. There is just a tad, just a tiny amount of sky in the upper portion of the image. And when it's that small amount of sky, I just have to wonder, can we survive with fully cropping that out? Because that would totally keep you in. And we then don't have that issue, that visual item that's potentially distracting us a little bit. Yeah, I, I agree with that because uh, if you tried to show a little bit more, it looks like uh, it's probably a pretty plain, lifeless sky anyway, so it wouldn't be that yeah. interesting. All right. And he's got a, another good black and white one here. You know, what I need to do, I really need to just go through these. This is literally my first time going through these images, so right. I am kind of just flying blind here. 
And Yarek has got certainly a lot of great images. So I'm just going to click through the rest of these images and make sure that we can see all of them. And then we can decide which one or which additional two we might comment upon. Now, this one I remember seeing because he submitted it earlier to the Facebook group. I'll come back to that one, I think. Right. Oh, my goodness. Lots of good yeah. ones here from Mr. Linoshka. All right. Um, so this one I wanted to comment on. It's a black and white of, uh, of three hikers in motion, and there's significant motion blur as they're walking by. But the thing I love about this is the idea that those feet, because, you know, your feet are still when you're hiking, they're planted on the ground, the one foot is planted on the ground, that's rendered sharply. And then you get this progressively more blurred fashion, this progressively more blurred sense of the person as you're moving up, you know, up the body because it's moving faster and faster. Now, one thing that I can't remember either, if this is a single person that's photographed three different times and then just put together in Photoshop or if it's three different people, because you could have the same effect happening. Um, right. Because of the the hand and, and what those are looking like, that's a little bit of a delineation, a little bit of difference, it feels like to me. So I'm going to guess that these are three different people. Yeah, looking at the shoes, I think they're different people. Mm, okay, yeah, I can see Maybe that with these from other two here for sure. I can I can see but some I, difference there. Yeah. I had the same thoughts at first, too, yeah. Yeah. So, Which one did you want to comment on? Was there one that you particularly uh, uh, they, stuck they out were, to you? Uh, there was none in particular. They were all really uh, interesting. Um, see, this one here was another waterfall one that uh, I liked. Yeah. Um, and again, it's a, a much more gentle waterfall, not a big, not a yeah. big fall area. Um, and I like the way, like the the whole scene with the fog in it, very moody and. Uh, the hills just sort of coming down to this nice uh, little waterfall and uh, even the uh, the grass in the foreground is nice and sharp and i, I think uh, yeah it's a very pleasing image yeah longer shutter speed so the water is extra silky smooth and then up top we do have some considerable interest in the sky where the fog you know, the, the hills are receding up into the fog, but then that fog takes on a very warm color. It does, yeah. Uh, due to the sunrise or sunset. And yeah, there's just some some nice things going on with the difference in what's happening in the sky, complementing nicely what's happening on the ground here. And certainly a, a successful capture overall. All right, this one, Jeremy Schwartz. So let's go ahead and we'll actually click through. So the first item here, we have a collection of looks like all of the images, and then we can click through and grab just the, take a look at just the individual shots. Nice panorama of, a couple of panoramas of some mountainous areas, nighttime shot so we can see the Milky Way. Looks like a little chickadee. Waterfall. Island, a tiny little island out in a lake with some mist and some fog rising. So I think I want to just have us talk about this one, if, if you don't mind taking it away here. Yeah, you picked the same one I was going to say. Um, All right. We, ha we actually have a tree coming out of a lake here, out of a stump uh, that this one sort of reminds me of. It's uh, well known in my area, but I like this. It's on a like a tiny rock island, just a, one rock. There's a single tree growing out of it. And uh, just sort of that solitude it shows there is uh, interesting. Um, and the contrast of a nice warm uh, fog and mist that's all around it uh, and the sun with the, uh, the gray or blues up top and, and the, uh, the green of the trees is interesting. There's those, uh, it looks like three smaller rocks uh, just in the foreground to the front and left of it. Um, interesting to have that little set of three there. Um, yeah. the only thing that distracted me a bit is the, the branches that are out of focus in the bottom right. Um, they, they sort of balance a bit with the uh, dark stuff on the left, but, uh, that's the only thing that really distracted me. I, I really like this image. And like I said, that was the one I was going to come back to. Too. Yeah. That, this is where I would give myself license to in Photoshop, just clone those items in the corner out yeah. and, and be done with it because, that's the only thing I might crop us a uh, hair off the bottom, but that will help emphasize, I, I believe the rising fog, because then your, your, the base of your image 
will just be this rising fog. Right now, it goes far enough to where we see the uh, significant amount of the reflections of the tops of the trees, and we start to see that blue color coming back in again. So just getting rid of a little bit of that is going to help keep, it's going to be warm on the bottom, cool on the top kind of an idea. And then whatever's left of those items in the far right-hand corner, uh, to me, I would give myself license just to clone those out. I know a lot of people would say not to do that, but I'm going to go ahead and be okay with something like that yeah. myself. Yeah. All right, Mark Peterson. Uh, he says, this year I've grown so much in my photography. That's awesome. And, and thank you, my, Mark. Excuse me, I think I said Mike. But thank you, Mark, for sharing these images. That's excellent. He says, in late March, I decided to only use a film camera for one month and I haven't stopped since. It has been a wonderful experience to go back to some basics and shoot full frame, in quotes, as he says, or larger for, for inexpensive. Um, film has freed me from some of the digital holes I have fell in, such as sharpness and colors, a very short list of things I have learned or improved on. So uh, it, this list that he's improved on, certainly about knowing your subject, less is more, he says. Each camera, oops, I clicked a button and it, and it expanded on me. Each camera has a use case and a target audience, and SLRs are not the only type of camera. Slowing down before you press the shutter button. Sometimes color is not needed in photos. Embrace flaws and keep taking pictures and learn more. All right, let's take a look at a couple of these photographs. So... Uh, this this first one, uh, some kind of river, and some fishermen are in the river. Uh, then we have a, a tree, a, a dead tree, significant, I don't want to call it a stump, this is a, more like a trunk, basically. And it's in a, a desert-type area with some some rocky background areas, but it feels somewhat desert-ish. Another river shot, feels like we're on the bank of a river, kind of up above, slightly overlooking a river. Uh, one of a child in a bicycle carrier, a bicycle trailer, I should say, some kind of house or cabin, and another black and white of a tree, a brick wall, and then a self-portrait also of him shooting. It looks like he's got a twin lens reflex. Now, have you shot, Drake, a twin lens reflex? I have. I actually have one sitting over on the bench oh, behind nice. me. Um, nice. Nice. Yeah, interesting to shoot. Let's nerd out just a little bit on the twin, twin lens reflex. The Those cameras, I really wish, I would love, it's, it's totally not unfeasible, not feasible at all, I'm sure. But I would love for some manufacturer to make a digital insert that could go into a twin lens reflex. I think that would be amazing. Yeah, it would. And I mean, they, they've made them for uh, the Hasselblad. Uh, um, so I don't think it would be that hard. I just think the cost no. is going to be way up there. The cost will certainly be way up there, and you know you'd have to take off the little back thing that folds in to hold in the film. I think that would be fine. I'd be happy to remove that device and put on a new one. But what you got with a twin lens reflex? Well, you got two lenses. Yep. One of them is what you look through and frame up the shot. And as is evidenced here in this image, he's in a mirror, so we can see what he's doing with the camera. You look down. You hold it either at your chest height like he's doing here or lower, whatever's comfortable for you. And then you've got this viewer, this viewfinder, this little box thing that folds up and allows you to see the image as you're, you know, as you're framing it up, but it's also in reverse. So that's a little bit strange. So left is right, right is left. But if I remember right, it's, it's correct top to bottom. Am I remembering that correctly, uh, Drake? Um, yes, I believe so. so yeah. I think it's correct top to bottom. It's just left to right is messed up. Yeah, and, and that, that takes some getting used to when you're doing it. It does. Yeah. And then you've got the other lens, which is what exposes the film. That, that's where the shutter is, and that's where the film is then exposed. So you do have this parallax difference, and that is you you have two viewports on on the world one the lens that you're looking at one is the lens that the film is capturing so you are going to have a difference in exactly what you're literally recording but that's also just to me part of the fun of it you know a little bit of a, a little bit of letting certain things go and mm -hmm. then when you load in your film these are going to be square format frames 
Uh, so it takes the 120 size film, which is six centimeters. So the the capture size is going to be six centimeters square. And you're going to get if you if you shoot 120, I want to say you get 12 exposures. But now I'm thinking, yeah, I think it's 12 exposures. And then if you get the 220 film, if your camera will take it, you get the 24 exposures. Um, so yeah. anyway, that that's it is fun to shoot for those. And then they really make you slow down. Um, oh my goodness. Which, which I find helps the process. You think about what you're doing a lot more, not just concentrate on the camera, but on the scene because yeah. I mean, first it costs a little bit more for every shot, but uh, uh-huh. you're putting so much effort into it that uh, you really want to uh, do it right. Yes. You know, to focus, you've got this little dial that's next to the lens box, probably the best way to put it. And that moves the whole front of the camera forward and backwards you know, it's not just turning something that's in the lens itself. It's yeah. moving that whole panel because certainly your lens that you're looking through also needs to focus. And then as you're turning that object, the that that dial, and it moves the whole body of the camera forward and backwards, you then, you know, it just to see that happening, it just adds more to the experience of what you're doing and then you understand how the whole system works to begin with is there's just, I don't know. It, it really adds value, I think, to the experience of, of photography. Absolutely. All right. So he's got a, it looks like someone is possibly getting married here. We've got a, a dress on the side we have some beach shots and uh, something with a bicycle. Oh, and a nice child with an Nikon 2000. Start them early. All right. One of the images I wanted to concentrate on, I'm going to fast forward to that. Whoops is this one here. This is a tree that's effectively silhouetted. And I'm going off of what Mark said about embracing the imperfections. And that's why I wanted to highlight on this image, because there are definitely some imperfections. We have three areas where there's some significant light leak that is affecting, you know, with some streaks. And then on the left hand side, it looks like we also have a light leak. And it's but it's more faded, as you go to the edge as you go to the the left hand edge. It also feels a little bit, at the moment, a little bit lower contrast where those dark areas just could be darker. If they're supposed to not have detail, they could be darker. But that's kind of one of the beauties of film photography, too, where you have a lot of latitude in what you're, what you're able to present, what you're able to record, and then what you're able to, if you're printing it in the dark room, there's a lot of latitude with what you can do to bring detail out in those areas. Yeah, and it uh, it's got uh, that film grain in it, different than yeah. what you have for noise, right? Uh, that whole quality and gives you a real old time feel. So, well, and yeah. in, in Lightroom has a grain function in it. And one of my students, they submitted a, 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 an assignment this last week where they use significant amounts of grain. And I invited them to, I was like, Hey, you know, whatever's in Lightroom, I want you to explore, especially because they were doing an assignment of discovery, as I called it. And it looked quite similar, almost similar to this, although this is actually in focus. Um, <laughs> so kind of a, a little jab sort of, but my students were, we made uh, pinhole cameras in the lab using Pringles cans and then attaching it to their camera. And so of course you don't get anything in focus. And so this student, he had nothing in focus, so he added a bunch of grain. I was like, well, you know, why'd you do that? Help us understand what's going on here with with what you're showing. And so it, it, it spurred a good conversation. And that's where, like what Mark was saying here, you know, embracing the imperfections. Yeah. It's it's certainly about the conversation. And then when you say, you, you know, you notice that film grain, yes, there's definitely some value, again, to that idea of the experience of enjoying the photograph in, in this side of, of it. Yeah. Not just the experience of creating the photograph, like we were talking about with the twin lens reflex experience, but here now and looking at it, that grain comes through even certainly in the digital world where it's been scanned and we're, we're enjoying it here on, on Facebook. All right. This next image is by Stephen Mares. And I, I'll, I should say next set of images, because we're going to click through. First off, we have a duck, gorgeous little duck. Oh, it is. But I'm going to try and click through really quickly. 
and we'll take a look at the various images. So a duck and an eagle, two images, uh, those are portrait style images, and then we've got an aurora borealis type image, uh, two of those, uh, some mountains, and some kind of uh, a deer, uh, and then lightning over a barn, some leaf detail, and then uh, a spiral staircase uh, going on up, you know, looking upwards, upwards, upwards nice and strong. And then an image from Chicago. So we're on the, the L, the, that's the, um, mo- many cities have a subway. Chicago has the L. So that's, it's a train system that runs in a loop around the downtown core and then also has other tracks that go away from the downtown core. But it's called the L because it's literally elevated off the ground. So, uh, and then one of the sculptures there in downtown Chicago. And I'm particularly familiar with Chicago myself because I grew up in Chicagoland. I never lived in the city, but we took a few trips over the, over the years into the city, usually rode the train and, uh, lots of, lots of good stuff. Uh, all right. So with, with these images, which one did you want to focus on yourself, Drake? Oh, we can start on the first one there with the duck. Yeah, let's do that. Go so I mean, I like this, the, uh, the duck's head, the eye and uh, feathers on the head are nice and uh, really nice and sharp. And uh, they've caught them with some drops of water coming off. And that little burst of uh, sunlight coming in from the top left corner and the rays there, um, again, it adds to the mood. And you can see it looks so very calm with those leaves just floating in front of them and the, uh-huh. the slight ripples. Um, just from the bird's actions of, I guess, uh, dipping himself in the water. So, yeah, he's kind of ruffling his feathers, yeah. washing himself, doing something. Lots of good detail in those head and neck feathers. I'm a little bit curious as to the lighting on this on this duck because we have, like you said, the rays coming in from the upper left-hand corner, but then we also have a significant light source coming from the right-hand side. Yeah. And we can see that catch light in the duck's eye makes me feel like it's a flash. I just don't know. Whatever it is, it does feel generally well balanced and it's not like it's garish and making me just go, oh, that's fake lighting or nothing. It's not nothing like that. No. It's just something that I noticed and I wanted to draw attention to because as people are looking at this image, I want you to be thinking about, one thing I would want you to think about is, you know, let's take a look, for example, the lighting on the beak there. The beak is more significantly lit on the right-hand side than on the left-hand side. So that suggests the light from the left-hand side is significantly backlight, whereas the light on the that's coming from the right is a little more front lighting as well. So it's just, how is that balanced out? <clears throat> Excuse me. How might you, you know, as, as an individual looking at this, just contemplating how might you do that differently or what do you like about it? And you want to try this yourself by all means, that's, you know, be inspired and go try it yourself as well. Uh, the one I wanted to look at and talk about that Eagle shot is really cool. Mm. These, um, yeah. Aurora images are really cool, but the one I wanted to talk about and contemplate on is this sculpture from Chicago. And so we've got this red iron, I assume it's iron, some kind of metal sculpture. I see some rivets in it. It's, uh, kind of goes up, it bends over, but it's very, very heavily vignetted. So the edges are very dark compared to the central area, but we have this sculpture. It's in some kind of plaza downtown. And then we've got the reflected buildings in the window behind it. And that's the thing I like about this image is we've got this very strong subject matter, but then we've isolated the background. The uh, Stephen has isolated that background very uh, effectively so that we are very limited in what we're able to see. And that really just helps enhance our experience in saying how, how cool, how strong, how magnificent is this sculpture, at least in Stephen's view here of what he's showing us. There's a lot of strength coming through in this sculpture. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, it- it's curious the you got the reflections on the one half of the windows in the back and the other yes none in them i'm not sure uh is that a large parking garage there or why there'd be no windows they just it not just reflecting? suddenly stops doesn't it that is yeah. kind of weird yeah. 
and I don't know why, (laughs) but that is just another one of those parts of the story. It would be nice sort of to have that, to have that resolved, but it, for some reason, it wasn't enough for me to not like this image and to say, mm, I just, it's, it's just so difficult to, no, it, to interpret. It makes you stop and think more about it. I think it adds to interest in it. There's a huge level of mystery there. Yeah. It, that's what I got out of it. It, yeah. it feels like this is the finished part, the uptown part of the city, and here's something that's not. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't know how to describe it otherwise. Yeah. All right, the next grouping of images is from David Patton. And um, I'm going to actually read really quick what he wrote. Didn't get out nearly as much as I would have liked this past year, but it was still tough going through all my pictures. I spent a lot of time at farms doing equine photography, got back into shooting analog and home developing. Hey, that's awesome. And overall had a good year in spite of being stuck close to home most of the time. Well, good. That's one thing that definitely uh, I got frustrated a little bit over of of being stuck close to home. But then, of course, I went and took a four week road trip. So that was awesome to be able to do that. But as longtime listeners know, my my genre of photography is definitely more the travel oriented and I mean, international travel. So to take on a more domestic approach this year, definitely it, it, it took a lot of changing, shall we say, a lot of, you know, changing expectations in uh, my own mind. So I could, I could get over those humps and, and uh, still produce some good work. So let's scroll through here and look at David's work. He's, he mentioned doing equine photography. So certainly we've got a, uh, this horse uh, here with looks like some blue smoke um, of some sort that is, uh, the horse is galloping about or prancing through whatever. Um, another kind of a, a farm related type image, rock walls. Those are, our, those can be very interesting. A winter scene, something here on the ocean, another pier going out to the ocean, back on the farm with some horses, a fence and someone, uh, you know, either climbing over a fence or somehow walking around the horse. Ah, a little fire. Love me a good fire. A little campfire type item. All right. So I wanted to go back. I'm going to go back and I'm going to take a look and talk about this image, Drake. This image, this is a beautiful shot of the pier. I don't have any information specifically about this image, but it's a pier that's going out into the ocean. the The sun is coming, you know, dist- distinctly from the the far right of the frame, where it's not in the frame. It's just that's the direction the light is coming from. And the water, as it's flowing in, we have a slow enough shutter speed to get a, a good amount of movement in the water, but also it, we still have some texture. So it's that nice balance of of shutter speed. So we have some good texture. And then the sky is just completely clear. It's a nice, clear blue sky. Uh, But then we also have a little bit of reflection here in the foreground where the sand is saturated. And so we're seeing a little bit of reflection with the pier that's heading out into the water. So on this shot, you know, I just as I look at it briefly, it feels like it's not the horizon isn't exactly level, but that could be just me needing to getting into Lightroom and verifying with the the crop rotation function to make sure that it actually is level where it needs to be. But otherwise, you know, this is a fairly symmetrical, symmetrically balanced image. It's even on top, the, the horizon comes straight through the middle. And I'm trying to decide if I like it that way, or if I want that horizon lifted up, because there's not much in the sky. I don't think there's going to be too much lost if we crop out some of that sky. And by doing that, we're also going to enhance the strength of that pier. It will lift it towards the top of the frame, and then it will enhance the strength of that pier coming in. And then it also enhances the importance of those waves in the lower section where all the light is and all the good motion is. What do you think? Right. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Position right in the center. It, it, uh, it does seem, like it needs something to strengthen it a little bit. Um, I was wondering if you lowered it a little bit 
so that sure. you had more negative space there. Um, and it was, you still had the reflections on, um, but maybe bring down the center line to the bottom third. There you go. Uh, then maybe the negative space would emphasize that a bit, but there you go. It's a very uh, nicely smooth out waves. They're not, you can still see the texture in it a bit. Yeah. Uh, and I think that might be what's uh, doing it a bit with horizon line. You can see there's some waves on the horizon. Right. And they make it hard to tell if it's straight or not. I do get yeah. that feeling. Feels a little bit off, but but not quite, right? Um, yeah. I, and yeah, I like it, your idea of lowering that horizon too. Both either, I think, are worthy of exploration because what we have here in the far foreground, and very near foreground, I should say, not far, but the very near foreground, we have this shadow area that is blank sand. And so to get rid of that, basically... Yeah. That's what that's what's going to happen to your horizon is your horizon will effectively drop in the overall framing. But I do like the idea in in what you're saying. I would prefer to just tilt the camera up, not right. necessarily just crop off the bottom. Yeah. Because by tilting the camera up, you're going to trade that space on the bottom for space on the top, and that's going to emphasize this the space of the negative space that you're talking about. And yeah, I definitely can see that. Yeah. Uh, that coming through. Was there an, uh, a different image that you wanted to specifically comment on? Uh, no, I think this was the one I would have come back to okay. as well. So. All right. Let's see here as we move, you know, and he had, uh, I in, encourage you guys, he had some pretty neat ones from the the barns and, and the yeah. farms type life that he was uh, talking about. So definitely go and, and take a look there at David's images as well. But now we're going to move on to Tammy, Tammy Mossbrucker. And here she says, these are my favorites for this year. While I know I have a lot to learn with my photography and post-processing, I was happy with these, uh, with the capture colors and lighting at the time of, of the capture of these. All right. So as we quickly uh, move through these, oh, here we go. Starting off with a wild horse of Theodore Roosevelt National Park. I probably maybe have a photograph of this same horse. Uh, I don't recognize it particularly. It's just I was there somewhat recently and photographed a few horses. This was my first time, she says, being close to these horses, even though I've been to the park many times. Oh, yes, it's a great park. The rolling hills of North Dakota. I like the light across the field, she says on this image. And when I was there driving through North Dakota, I tell you what, it just made me want to just take off onto those very rural roads and just keep driving until I found something cool. Um, all right, this next image, uh, something about her grandson's uh, football team. So that's cool. The next one here is a little lighthouse, uh, Duluth Harbor. So they're on, in, in Lake Superior. And uh, little, a lot of bit of clouds with some power lines, stormy sky, uh, three wind machines in the field there in North Dakota. Cross Ranch State Park in North Dakota, another moody day, she says. And as we click through the rest of them, we'll, we'll quickly just, for those on the YouTube, you'll be able to see these as I'm clicking through the rest of them. Uh, which one did you want to start off with, Drake? Uh, we can do the clouds with power lines. All right. So let's fast forward to clouds with power lines. There we go. So, yeah, I like, uh, I like this. Uh, the nice colors in the sky above those clouds, those billowing yeah. white uh, clouds right in the center and uh, how the, the power lines and the towers lead you right into those clouds. Um, I like that. The dark green field, I thought maybe they could have uh, lifted that a little bit lighter. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, this, this one that uh, really caught my eye going through it, the, a nice warm pastel -y colors in there. Yeah, by bringing a little bit of light into the foreground, we would have just a, a little more resolving of what all that is and understanding of what all that is. Yeah. The clouds right there in the central part, I mean, those are interesting because we've got some significant billowing features, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. But then we have the high-level clouds, those that are super high in the atmosphere, uh, up above and behind, and they're being brilliantly lit by the sunset. It feels like sunset anyway. 
Um, her her uh, comment, Stormy Sky, the clouds were incredible this day. I did not enhance over much. The colors were vibrant. Yeah. Um, yeah, so this is this is where is such a unique sensation of those clouds and how those clouds came together. There's a lot of a lot of interest, a lot of value, I think, in this image. And um, toning down just a hair, I would say, the the excessive bright areas in the sky, just a hair, tone that down, and then bring up the shadow areas, and boy, this would just knock it out of the park. Uh, the image I wanted to talk about is uh, this one in Duluth Harbor. The the thing that I think intrigues me about this image is part partly its simplicity. We were talking about in one of the previous images where we wanted to lower the horizon one way or the other. And this time the horizon comes right through the center. And I actually don't feel that a thing needs to be done here uh, to the overall composition. I do appreciate the the fact that this lighthouse is the only thing that's kind of this reddish orangish color. And so it's very commanding in its presence. The only thing I might suggest trying to do is just work the sky a tiny bit more to try and get just a little more of that cloud detail. Yeah, it's kind of a, a moody day, but we we'll, we can lose that mood if it's just a little bit too bright. Now, when I say, you know, work with the cloudy detail and such, I definitely would not want that to affect what's ever going on in the lighthouse and the concrete bunker that it's on. If anything, I would want to enhance that just a little bit more as well. And then whatever texture is going on in the water, I think is just fine. It's beautiful. But if we had just a little bit more in the sky, it would balance it out perfectly. And we would get a stronger, slightly stronger sense of that mood. Yeah, you can definitely see there's detail there. It just needs to be brought up yeah. a little bit more. Yeah. Steve Connery's images. These are uh, nice and warm, it looks like. At least that we're going to start off nice and warm. Grand Canyon sunrise, he says. Mm -hmm. And then um, I would presume this one is also from Grand Canyon, but he went and did a black and white conversion. And another black and white conversion of some of the hoodoos at Bryce Canyon. And then Canyonlands Overlook is this next one. It looks like we have some uh, erosion features, you know, erosion patterns, I should say. And then Arches, channeling my inner Angel Adams, he says. So he has a nice, dark, uh, vibrant, but uh, dark sky with some really high contrasty clouds wisping through. And then, of course, the, the texture on the rocks. And then Yellow Sunset at Arches National Park. And then some plant details on a few images. And then it looks like a kind of like a, a ridge um, a sunset overlook on a, with uh, two trees, different types of trees. And then a succulent plant detail, a lake shot. All right, so... Which one did you want to start off with, Drake? So I, I think if we go to the, that one there. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I, I uh, thought this was going to be the one you wanted to do. So, yeah. so take it away. Describe this image for so, us. So, I mean, I, I did like the one before in color there, but yeah. uh, this in black and white here uh, with all the layering you can see looks really nice. Um, just, again, it's very moody, atmospheric. That uh, uh, dead tree that's in the foreground there, um, it's actually seems almost unnaturally bright behind it, but it kind of uh, does, but that's what totally draws your eye to it. Yeah, absolutely. But I say it really, uh, your eye is drawn to that as a feature in it. Um, and it really enhances it. Um, the, uh, little plateau on the right, just beside it, there has a small little bush on it. That's, a, um, I don't know. It's sort of interesting little feature, but, um, just overall, I like this. Like I say, I really like the, that layering mm -hmm. and uh, taking away the color from it enhances that for me. And, yes, you know, yes, for it, sure. It's very interesting. The one I wanted to talk about is where he talks about Ansel Adams, this one from yeah. Arches, and it's a fairly wide angle, it feels like, and we're looking up fairly sharply, fairly steeply, and everything just points directly to those clouds, and then those clouds just kind of actually continue drawing you up and up. And oftentimes I'm more interested in a composition that will keep the eye in and will keep you moving about the image. This one doesn't necessarily do that. This brings you from below and lifts you up. Yeah. And 
it keeps going up when you have those clouds, but it starts to get dark enough at the very, very top that you do tend to not just be launched completely off the frame. You do kind of start to circle back around just naturally, or you, you don't really circle back around, but you feel like you've come to a dead end and you're forced to turn back around basically is what happens. Uh, but great texture coming through in the sky. Um, all, you know, the great little things with the little bushes here in the foreground. Uh, one of the only things I, I kind of wish Steve would have been able to do is to control air traffic and keep that contrail. It looks like we have a contrail yeah. going in the somewhat lower left yeah. section of it, but I'm just kind of joking there. Uh, but otherwise, you know, certainly the yeah. just a wonderful image to... Uh, it, it just may be the way that uh, it naturally is, but it could be, everything yeah. looks like it's leaning to the right slightly. Yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah. It kind of does feel that way, huh? Yeah. I wonder. Yeah. If it just needs a little bit of a tilt too. I yeah, don't know. It could just be the angle he took it at. All right. This next set of images, John Anderson, he comments in no particular order. He says, here's my favorite from this year. I had more man-made structures in my images than I expected. Most are local for me and a few from a September trip to Iceland. Awesome. So we'll probably just try and pick out one per person. Oops, I, did I click the wrong thing again? Here we go. Let's click the right buttons. Oh, that's a nice symmetry type shot. Very good. You know, when I'm thinking of oh, that idea of balance and symmetry and asymmetry, I'm noticing in my photography, I don't have a whole lot that shows perfect symmetry usually. Mm -hmm. And when I see it, though, it really sticks out at me because I just published a a lesson on on balance in latitude photo school so it's just really been on top of my mind these last few days oh this is yeah this is interesting we have a lot of good images uh in this from john anderson it's gonna be hard to pick one. Oh, here's a seasonal image that's interesting where we have the same direction the same framing but depending on which part of the image you're looking at he's transitioned from spring uh from summer to fall to winter to spring and that's uh yeah, that's kind of interesting. So, which one did you want to comment on? Uh, the uh, the one you talked about symmetry with the uh, uh, this one here. Yeah. So, yeah. Again, uh, being a city shot in that, it's not what I do very much, but sometimes these really attract me, right? Yeah. Uh, and uh, um, I like that. Uh, I'm not sure what uh, uh, government building it is there, but it sort of looks like a capital type building in the center. And yeah. everything sort of is drawn towards that. It's nicely lit. Um, the uh, sky fading from the bright, warm pinks on the right side over a little more bluish on the left and reflections. Yeah. 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 Very nice. Nice treatment of colors. He says this is skyline of Madison, Wisconsin. So I'm assuming that's uh, that's going to be the something there with the state capital, possibly. Yeah. Um, all right. This next set of images comes from Trond Eide, and it says here, here are some of my 2021 images. I love making images, I guess, uh, excuse me. I love making images, so I guess I'm all over the spectrum and haven't developed a style yet. Just, I live just outside of Bergen on the northern coast of Norway. Okay. Hashtag so jealous. Yeah. <laughs> I would love to visit that area. I Bergen has, I don't know, it's been on my somewhat shorter list of places to visit for quite a long time. And, oh, that would be amazing. Okay, back on track. Uh, off the western coast of Norway, so a lot of my images are including the sea or water. In 2021, I did a lot of long exposures and found a love of doing more arty, as he calls it, images. Yeah, so let's take a look at some of these with the longer exposures. A solid uh, image here of a rock with the water, you know, just rippling and whatnot about it. But with a long exposure, it definitely translates into a much different surface. Yeah. Uh, nice. Um, mm -hmm. Very, the coloration on this image is really interesting. It's, yeah. It feels, it feels like it's got a copper tone to it of, of some yeah. sort. He, as I'm clicking through, just uh, some nice, you know, just some really good intriguing images. So if those of you on the audio only, I definitely 
I want to encourage you do this search in the, um, in the Facebook group, top images, 2021 is the topic we're looking at. And as you enjoy all these images, there's just a lot to go through. Now we, we have some in-camera movement as well. And this can be really difficult to do in order to get it just right. Because I know for me, if I try it on a quote, normal tripod, the, the ability for it to keep in line as I'm moving the camera up or to the side or whatever, there's always going to be some little bit of a jerkiness, some little bit of a, it, it interrupts the smooth flow that I'm going for. And when I had a gimbal head, that's when it really worked really well. I no longer have a gimbal head, but you could really get some smooth action with that. So I'm wondering what you think, Drake, on, a, on an image like this with in-camera movement. Yeah, I, actually, this is incredibly well done. I, I find it's very hard to get something this smooth without those yeah. little jerks at the end or beginning. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, these kinds of things, it really abstracts. And then also he's got additional items that he posted uh, tagged onto this image as well. So I invite listeners to hunt that down and take a look and enjoy these images of in-camera movement because it just really makes a different appeal for the subject. It totally removes, you know, I think we can still understand this was made from trees, but <laughs> it's such an abstraction. It's so beautiful. Love those kinds of things. In a nighttime shot, uh, someone looking over the sea, and they've got a headlamp on, so that's kind of cool. Uh, sunset or sunrise type shot, long exposure, good uh, coloration coming off of, again, it feels like a copper tone effect, really, on the, the sea rocks and the, and the seashore areas there. So lots of, yeah, lots of great images here from Trond. And thank you so much for submitting those. All right, these next images come from Brett Baker. And we're starting off with, um, it looks like, uh, this is my first pano, he says. It looks like it uh, might be from some salt flats. It could be snow, but I, I want to say it feels more salt flat oriented because of what's here in the foreground. We have just standard kind of sand, whatever, in the foreground. Uh, then we have first attempt at abstract, he says. This is the reflection of trees in a mountain lake during the fall. Nice bright and airy image here. Yeah, quite a different and, look. And it, and it definitely, you know, I appreciate the exposure to make it nice, bright and airy and bright colors. The camera will want to make this a really dark image comparatively. And so when you override that, it definitely can give you that bright and airy sense. That's kind of nice. Skipping a few images here. Let's talk about this one. He says, just feels contemplative. What do you think, Drake? Yeah, it, it's got that uh, air of mystery with the, mm -hmm. uh, the structure in the background just disappearing into the fog. You can't quite make out what's up there. Um, and the, the length of the exposure was interesting that it gives you those swirls of the waves. You can tell what's happening there. Um, but yeah, it's got that mystery in it, and I like that. And then on the somewhat central area in the, in the left-hand side, we've got this pier element that's well-defined and as dark as the darkest thing in the frame. So that provides a bit of an anchoring element to it as well. Yeah. And yeah, this is, this is interesting. The only thing I wish for is a little more somewhat, somehow some kind of detail in the water. It feels like it does go uh, possibly pure white, mm -hmm. but... The composition is nice and strong, I think. The motion that's happening is is nice and uh, eloquent. It, the the way it's the way those wave actions are done, but then certainly, like you started out with saying that structure, whatever that is, it feels kind of like it might be a lighthouse, but it could be like a major foundation or something for a big bridge or something even. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, we just don't see the 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 tops of it. I don't know what this is, but how it disappears and then we just have this nothingness up above it. That's, yeah, that's kind of cool. All right, Tim Lawson, we have some images. Uh, not necessarily my best, he says, but certainly a year in review. And one thing is painfully obvious, I'm not going out taking images for myself nearly enough and certainly not capturing landscapes as often as I used to. Yeah, well, if you need a little bit of a kick in the pants, maybe this bull will help that, Tim. Uh, get out there and shoot some, get out there and shoot some landscapes. Yeah, we have some, an interesting uh, detail shot here. Yeah. I'm not sure what I'm looking at. One, one of the labels says poison. Yeah. It looks like the central item is a big syringe. 
but then I'm not sure what the other vials are for, but that it is an interesting, all the textures and the metal reflections and the glass reflections, yeah. kind of interesting. All right, another uh, bucking bull, bucking bronco type item, uh, but this is very much a bull. Looks like that poor bull's, um, he's got a crooked horn. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It just looks painful. Uh, the but then the stuff. guy, he's being, he's being bucked off completely. He's, yeah. he's not yet hit the ground, but he's going. And then a little girl kind of out in the, out in the wilderness idea here, uh, more cattle, uh, cattle range and kind of an idea, historic car with a couple of characters. Now here's a buck and Bronco. Okay. Uh, let's see. The horse is probably a foot to a foot and a half off the ground. So the, the base of the feet, the hooves, are about a foot to a foot and a half off the ground. And the fellow, he is barely hanging on, if you can say that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. All right. A few other good images here with uh, some, again, more horses, a few family pictures type items. All right. Thank you, Tim, for yeah. those images. Interesting stuff. And Mike Pal Palhegi, I hope I'm saying that right. Apricot blossoms. This this next one is some kind of uh, sculpture type. I don't know my Nahual N A H U A L. Too long at home, he says. Mm -hmm. And then some motocross type items. Yeah. Some good pictures there at 13,000 feet in my electric Jeep 4XE. So that would be, yeah, I want to get up to 13,000 feet. Yeah. yeah. Mm, let's talk about this one. This is uh, Oceanside, California. Yeah, I like this. Uh, the uh, sun setting there, I take it uh, just barely over the horizon, right, right between uh, some of those uh, pillars of the uh, pier and... Uh, Nice, nice warm colors in the sun and uh, reflected again on the beach on the wet uh, sand. Looks very nice. Yeah. And we've got also just the, you know, the, didn't show the whole pier, but we certainly know it's a pier. Yeah. And all we have is the legs and the, the support structure. And the sun is right there between a couple of them. And you just, yeah, it feels very peaceful, even, even though these strong, very strong graphic elements are interrupting the scene, it still has a sense of, of peace and stability, I, I believe. All right. Um, we're going to talk about our own images here in a moment. We have one more person to talk about, and then we're going to talk about our own images. So Chaz Nolis, and here we have Pinnacle's, Pinnacle Butte's Sunrise. Nice panorama type image. Bonnie Grizzly is this next one. Wyoming Red. Nice contrast. Yep. A few few ducks. Salish Sea Sunset. Autumn Swirl, another in-camera movement type yeah. item with some leaves it looks like. So that's, that's always nice to see experimentation like that. Twin Sisters Autumn. Let's go ahead and end on this one for our listener uh, review images. What do you think about this one, Drake? Yeah, it's got a nice variety in here. You've got uh, uh, the green trees, but you can tell it's uh, autumn here with some of the yellows that are coming in. Um, up top, you've got the uh, the nice sort of wispy clouds going across. Um, and uh, right in between the, the trees in the foreground and in the sky are the nice uh, sharp peaks of the mountains there. Yeah. And a uh, nice amount of snow on them. Uh, but there's still a lot of detail in them. They look good. Yeah. Yeah. The, the mountains certainly, I think that's what makes it in yeah. this image. To me, I, I think the, the mound on the right hand side is a little bit too prominent because it does come up as high in the image, mm -hmm. if not slightly higher than the mountains in the background. But though, you know, I, I, I want to concentrate on those mountains and that thing just yeah. keeps me a little bit from concentrating on those mountains, but that relationship of the mountains and the clouds, definitely that's what does it for me on this yeah. image. Those are, those are pretty strong elements for me. All right, let's take a look at, um, at your images and tell us about your experience this year, this last year, I should say of, of photography. Um, we, we start off with this image that you titled shades of blue. Sure. So, I mean, you can see, I put them into a blog here. 
and write about them. But you know, basically, this was one of these things where I was glad I had my camera with me because I was just taking my car in for servicing. And right across the street is this uh, glass building. Mm. And the beautiful sky in the background had these nice wispy clouds. And when you look straight on it, because the the angle of the sun, the one side was lit up much brighter than the other. Sure. And uh, I liked the contrast in the light lines and the dark lines between the two sides. Um, and uh, so I took it straight on or as straight as I could. And nice. uh, um, I just sort of like the patterns in it between the grid and the randomness of the clouds and the blues. Yeah. It kind of makes me think we have a, a building on campus that's nearly all glass and I've done some work that's kind of sort of like this uh, on that. And that can be really fun to explore what's happening because the glass we think of as flat panes, but they have a little bit of shape to them themselves and they distort what they reflect. And so that can be fun to explore. But here we've got the grid pattern, which is the lines between the panes of glass. And then, as you mentioned, the two uh, pain, the two, uh, you know, planes, I guess I should say, where we have distinctly differently lit areas. And then that just adds different amounts of complexity. But we come back to the simplicity because of the way it's framed, the, the color palette, you know, that all helps us interpret that image more appropriately, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Right. Uh, your next image here uh, says uh, in, in Cape Scott Provincial Park. So uh, San, San Joseph Bay, talk right. us through this one, San Joseph Bay Sea Stacks. So this is, uh, I live on the south end of Vancouver Island, and this is about a seven and a half hour drive for me to get to. Oh my. Um, but I love this park. It, it's amazing. Um, the only place you can really see decent sea stacks on Vancouver Island is up there. Okay. And uh, um, most of the time, the uh, the tide is out. Um, it's only at higher tide when it comes in and really washes over. But you can see it in the background. The waves are just starting to crash uh, on the back left side of it. Uh, and it was just getting up there. But it was one of those days that had been had a very light rain and you had that sort of mist in the background. So it gave you some nice separation behind it. Um, and in order to get that, I had to be, I was a long ways back with my telephoto lens because up close, you just couldn't get the same angle. So. Sure. Absolutely. All right. I think, and, and I invite, I will include in the show notes and in the YouTube description, the link directly to your blog here. Right. And um, so people can go and take a look at all of your images that you have here. So what we're generally looking at, I mean, you live on Vancouver Island there off yeah. the, the coast. Yeah. Well, it's part of British Columbia, but off the, the mainland coast there and in, in um, the southern part of British Columbia. And so we have a, a nice collection, a nice selection of various landscape images that's coming from this region. Uh, one of the ones, I guess, <laughs> the reason I wanted to hover on this last one that you have, mostly just because of the lines, the design elements that happen in this image. So talk us through snow on the eye way, and it's eye as in what we use to look, eye way. Yeah, so this, um, I've got a, a DJI Mini 2 drone okay. and uh, took it out. And I like sometimes you look just straight down and get that view you would like with a satellite. But yeah, this is much more personal. You can you can get in exactly what you want. And we had had uh, some fresh snow here. And, and like uh, many other areas in the Pacific Northwest, don't get it all that often, right? Um, yeah. So I went out with the drone and I live in a small town. We got uh, the one traffic circle in the middle and um, there's enough traffic there that uh, the main road uh, coming from left to right here is very clear as is uh, at the bottom of the screen. Um, that's actually the entrance to a uh, uh, big shopping mall. Um, okay. And then at the top of the screen, you can see it's not as well traveled. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's a smaller area with a bank in that. But the way this uh, pattern is there, it really reminded me of one of the uh, um, Egyptian hieroglyphic eye mm. symbols. They yeah, all have yeah. that sort of eye with something sweeping off of it. So uh, those lines there were quite strong, and I thought uh, it really attracted me to it. Um, and I took a couple shots uh, similar to this, one without cars, which was interesting, but 
I thought when you added the cars, it added sort of that element of, uh, of the motion in there and was interesting to me. Totally. And you've got the, the different colors of those vehicles too. You know, if yeah. they're all white, black, or gray, it just wouldn't be the same, but you've no. got an orange vehicle, red, blue, or teal, some other. Yeah. And, and that, that just really helps add some interest to it. Well, for yeah, sure. It does with everything else being almost black and white because of the snow. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right. So on my images, I have mine in Lightroom because, well, I have them in Lightroom still. <laughs> Just this morning as we record this, I finished my final selects and it was difficult. Let me tell you, it was difficult to get uh, everything boiled down because I had a little bit going on earlier in the year. And then, of course, I had my big four week road trip where a majority of these come from. This, and I'm going to mostly go through fairly quickly. And then I have already made, uh, there's a post that's going to come out here on, uh, it'll show up on Friday afternoon. So if you're listening to this later, certainly go into the Facebook group for the Latitude Photography Podcast and search that out. And you can see them all there in a separate post. And I did tag it, Top Images 2021. So it'll be easy for you to find. And um, so this first image comes from Strawberry Falls. This is part of my explorations that I did in getting ready for my big trip because my big trip had me doing a lot of backpacking and camping. And so it had been a while since I had been backpacking. So I figured I better go on a few small trips, backpacking trips, so that I can, you know, not be shocked like mad when I'm actually out there with nothing else on Isle Royal National Park. So this is one of those images that I took at Strawberry Falls uh, in the springtime or actually early summer when I was getting prepared for this trip. And then a small detail shot. Um, this is actually a focus stack too. It's three different images because I'm so close, but I'm also using a fairly wide depth of field. I needed to use a focus stack technique so that I could get everything in, in focus that I wanted to. If I were to shut down that depth of field, I would have gotten too much movement in the leaves, those prominent leaves were just kind of dangling over there. The wind blew those around, so I needed to use a faster shutter speed so I could get those frozen, but then uh, also work with the water so I still have movement in the water. So it was a little bit of a tricky shot, but but got it in the end. And now uh, this is where the images start to, in my kind of, starts to get a little more exciting maybe. And that's another trick we have, I think, Drake, in selecting our top images of a year. You know, if I had been able to, to select a theme to say like water is my theme or whatever, it would have been so much easier Absolutely. to pick out these top images. But it's, it's not something that I necessarily want to focus on a specific theme. I want to tell the story of what my year was like. Yeah. And so trying to do that succinctly, and in this case, I was able to boil it down to 10 images Boy, that was hard. <laughs> How oh, was that process for you? How did you go in that process? Yeah, it was the same thing. Like you say, if, if you had a theme to go by, it would be great, but it, it's sort of eclectic. Um, and I had boiled it down. I finally got it down to about 30. And I yeah. I didn't do nearly as much uh, photography this year as in past years. And that was hard. And then boiling down to which ones. And I, I wasn't going for my best images of the year but sort of my favorite because they meant something right yeah. um so just narrowing that last down to the last 10 there yeah it got quite difficult so yeah i i, I cut out some very otherwise favorite images of mine yeah because I did want all the images to play well together. That's something that if I were to show this, my, my intent when I do this, I will put these on my website eventually as a box set. And so right. they would be able to be, uh, as, you know, an, an item or these, these prints come together in a box set. And the notion is that they're going to be pretty much the same size. I mean, they have, we have different croppings and whatnot, but they'll be pretty much the same physical widths. So I'll print them on my 13 by 19 printer. So they'll be about 18 inches wide, uh, up to 18 inches wide, depending on what size you want to buy. And then they just have to still play nice together still though. So it's about a story of my year in photography where I don't go overboard because I had like 63 or something on my first edit. And then I whittled it down to 20 something. And then I was just like, a little more, a little more, a little more. And then finally, I was just like, do I, you know, this image, does it really does it really define 
my year. And so with the image that I'm looking at now on screen, I would say, yes, it does help define my year because I shot probably at least five of these overall on my road trip. But okay. this is the one that I chose to represent this notion, this idea of the roots detail as they're being exposed by the weather, basically over time, they become more and more exposed and the, the dirt erodes a little bit around them. Uh, and I just, boy, there's just something about it that yeah. caused me to to gravitate to that image and want to make sure I kept it. Uh, and then this location on Isle Royale National Park with the water crashing up against uh, the the shoreline there had such a fantastic time here, but this is also where I soaked the camera and the story that went behind that. So there's just an extra meaning to me at least. But I chose this particular image out of the, probably I haven't counted, but out of the probably 50 or 60 images that I took here, I chose this particular image because of the way that that water line continues on the lower right-hand side, uh, continues that line that's created in the rock and that rock ledge. Yeah. And because of that, to me, that helps strengthen the overall composition. Another thing I should say on these images, I'm not saying that my processing is done yet on these. Uh, I'm in the process, I'm going to be making an, an art show here shortly. And so though, that's when I will go through the final processing of these images to make sure they are top notch, ready to go type images. Now, was that last one, one of the ones that you had done the painting uh, conversion as well? So yes, I did. Um, I don't think it was this exact framing, but I did convert this scene to a painting for my sabbatical project. Yeah. And that was... Uh, certainly go photograph and then create create works that are more design oriented, a uh, balance between art and design. And so I decided to dive deep into digital painting. And so, yeah, I, I, again, I don't think it was this. Actually, it may have been this exact framing because what I did, I cropped it to vertical, come to think okay. of it. Yeah. And so it, it probably was this exact, this exact frame, but um, chopped out a little bit on the left and a lot of bit on the right and did a vertical presentation. Of yeah. It. So it's even more representative of your year too then. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this one, this next one comes from Grand Portage State Park in Minnesota. So that rock wall on the right-hand side, that's Canada. And the rock wall here on the left-hand side, that is the U.S. And I just also just liked this image for the texture that's coming through in the rock and that calm river. And we get a little bit of a sense of flow uh, with a little bit of whatever's in the water there. But otherwise, it's a, at this location, it's a very calm location of the river. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, that prominent rock here in the foreground that really just is effectively, it's a, it's a triangle and it points you, keeps you into the frame, so to speak. But then the lines and everything on the left-hand side lead you up to almost no man's land, so to speak. We do have a little bit of clouds in the sky there. Uh, this is an exposure blend. So I used Lumenzia uh, plugin for Photoshop extension, I should say, for Photoshop to bring in those details in the clouds a little more effectively with another exposure. And then also those highlights in the rocks on the Canadian side also had to use that to, to bring in the detail over there so it wouldn't just be completely blown out and washed out. Uh, this next one comes from Devil's Kettle uh, Falls. And I'll just, again, I'm just going to kind of go a little bit quickly through here. We've seen uh, many, many times, we, I think we've, uh, frequent listeners especially, have seen or heard me talk about these images. So I don't necessarily feel the need to go in a deep dive in all of them, but also we didn't do a deep dive on anyone else's kind of an idea. This one comes from Theodore Roosevelt National Park. And yeah, this was kind of fun. I showed this one to my photography class at the school as I was introing the lesson on luminosity masking. And when this one came up, the students were just kind of like, yeah, we're not going to make that. <laughs> and I was like, no, I'm not, I'm not intending that you're going to make it. I'm just trying to show you this is what's potentially possible. And I would even su submit, there's some other photographers out there that do even better, a lot better than what this is. I, I'm proud of this image for sure, but I recognize I still, in this genre of the work, I have a lot left to learn. But I, I certainly am proud of this image, too. So yeah, it made my final cut. Yeah, beautiful. This one felt a little bit out of place. This is also from Theodore Roosevelt National Park. This is a stump from the petrified forest area at Theodore Roosevelt National Park. But I just loved how it basically vibrates off the background. And I really didn't do hardly anything to this image except convert it to black and white. 
there's a little bit of this, a little bit of that, but there's nothing like that's just like, here's the magic juice that made this image pop. It just popped all by itself. When I was there shooting it, I knew it was a popping type thing and it still pops for me. Yeah. It just popped a lot better in black and white for me. Right. And then from Badlands National Park, this panorama with the hiker slash trail runner taking a pause and overlooking the valley kind of thing with the, the, the sun right in the middle. So a nice symmetry sort of there uh, with the left to right balancing act of, of items. Uh, same exact location, just a different framing. This is the one I turned into a painting for, for uh, Badlands and made it into a poster. So I chopped the, the sides off just a little bit on this one so it would be the, the 16 by 20 format on my painting project. And that's it for my pictures. Yeah, great. Time. All right. Well, a couple last things to talk about, and that is going to be just want to make sure everyone is um, aware we're going to have a what I kind of call now, I guess we can say a printing geek out workshop that is going to happen in the, in the Palouse June 13 through 17, 2022. I've only got a few seats left and I invite you y'all to take a look at the website, just my website, brentbergroom.com and then click on that workshops link and you'll see, or I should say mouse over it and then you'll see the link that goes directly to the Palouse shoot and print workshop where we're going to spend several days not only heading out into the fields shooting and getting some awesome images of this just gorgeous farmland. It's probably one of the most popular farmlands for photography. And I've rented a place, uh, an Airbnb, that is large enough to host a small group where we're going to be printing during the heat of the day. Now in June, it doesn't get that too terribly hot. It's a cooker in August, but anyway, in June, it doesn't get too terribly hot. But in the middle of the day, when the light is super harsh anyway, we're going to start learning how to print and uh, going through that print process. I also had an inquiry if I could, you know, give at least one presentation, one idea when we're doing those sessions about digital painting. And I said, you know what, I'm going to go one further. I'm also going to bring a few of these Wacom tablets. So I've got the Intuos Pro tablets that I can use and bring. And so we're going to bring a few of those. Probably can't bring enough for everybody, but I will at least bring a few of them so we can kind of trade off and have some experience exploring the, the realm of digital painting as well. So if that interests you, you know, if you want to do the digital painting, I'm certainly this isn't all about digital painting, but if that interests you and you wanted to be able to explore that, by all means, we would be able to add that to the workshop and that would just be a fantastic experience. So June 13 to 17, 2022, and uh, would just love to, to have people uh, take, check it out. It will also include four months of latitude photography school. So if that is something that you wish to uh, also put in the, the back side of your, your mind there, you, uh, we can get you signed up for a, a four month trial included with the workshop. If you wanted to have access to the online printing course and the creativity and the design and creativity and photography course. So lots of things uh, available here in the Palouse on my shoot and print workshop. All right, Drake, thanks so much for coming on with me. It's just fantastic to have had this conversation talking with you about all these wonderful items. Thanks a lot, Brent. I really enjoyed it. And these these images from, from you folks has just been wonderful. Thank you so much for submitting these images. And one last little item to, to mention, I am going to take a break. This is going to be the last episode for about a month and a half. I, so I shouldn't probably use the term the last, but this is going to be, uh, there's going to be a little bit of a break here because I do have my art show that I was talking about. And while that's going to be some amazing content coming here on the podcast in the future, I need to focus my energies on producing that item. So I've got a lot of, uh, just a lot of production to do with printing and where it's going to be lots of large format printing. So I've decided what I'm going to do. I'm going to make it more like a, oh, how do I call it? Uh, like a museum where you walk in and you see the big panel, you see some photos, you see some text, you, you get to understand the story of what's going on with whatever it is you're looking at. And so I'm going to create 
lots of big panels like that, they're gonna be printed on a fabric material. And so then they will hang in the art gallery. And because it's fabric, it's gonna have a little bit of that potential for it to move just a little bit in the wind as, as people are walking by or what have you. And then certainly I'll have my photographs printed, but then it'll all lead to those final pieces, those posters that I did with digital painting items included on those posters. So it's gonna be a huge production and I just got a lot of work. It needs to happen in the next seven weeks. Uh, actually, it's closer to six weeks. So I have a, a huge crunch time for that. So I'll be back in mid-March with more of our Latitude regulars and more other interviews, more shows where it's just me and stuff like that too. I'm sure we'll be talking about this whole the whole art show production things and a whole lot more. So certainly stay tuned, stick around. We definitely will be back, but I do need to take it just a little bit of time so I can produce this art show and have a good success with it. Do keep involved in the, uh, in the Facebook group. I'm definitely gonna be staying, hanging around there. So as you want to post your pictures and things like that, certainly I invite that and thank you so much. That's it for today. Thank you, everyone. Thanks again, Drake. Really do appreciate it. And until next time, happy shooting.